We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. I guess this is the beginning of the main session on... Um, that's backwards. No, keep your eyes on the screen. The, right. the screen and basically, I was actually looking for... Uh, uh, <laughs> sorry, this very much took me by surprise. I was looking for Suki, um, Suki Hyun, to start us. And I'm um, still getting used to the, uh, the, the, the screen, and I see some of our. This is the main session on digital cooperation, uh, Quo Vadis. So, so where are we going? Where are we? Where have we been? So um, to start off, I'd like to pass the floor. Thank you very much, and greetings to Poland here from Germany. Um, I hope that you can hear me properly. I also would like to express my warm welcome to the main session on inclusive internet governance, ecosystems, and digital cooperation. And before I start, or before we start our discussion, I would like to introduce um, the, the distinguished panel to you. And of course, um, the moderator, um, Arvi, thank you very much uh, for taking over this job. And I would like to start with uh, Jean-Paul Adam, the Director of uh, Technology, Climate Change, and Natural Resources Management in the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. We also have Vin Cerf with us, the Vice President and Chief uh, Internet Evangelist at Google. We have Raul Echeverria, Executive Director at Asociación Latina Americana the Internet with us. Justin Fair is, I hope, here also in our call, Senior Advisor for Multilateral Cyber and Digital Policy in the Bureau of International Organizations Affairs at the United States Department of State. Um, and I also welcome Anita Gurumurti, Founding Member and Executive Director of IT for Change. Milton Müller will join us a little bit later. He's uh, currently in another session and will come and join us, I think, uh, um, 15 to 30 minutes later. He's professor at the Georgia Institute of Technology and the director of the Internet Governance Project. We have Nena Nwakan Ma, chief web advocate at World Wide Web Foundation with us. El Kazir, director general, sector and global programs, um, of German agency for international cooperation, GIZ. And last but not least, Maria Francesca Spatolisano with us, the Assistant Secretary General for Policy Coordination and Interagency Affairs. And of course, um, Avi Doria, who is um, very much experienced with the IJF, um, currently member of the ICANN board and an independent researcher. And um, yes, I, I will also post the short bios in the chat while we will be discussing. Um, and. So back to you, Avi. Thank you very much. And yes, quite, quite a list of panelists we have. So before I say anything else, I'm going to admonish us all to be fairly brief, to try and keep within two, three, four minutes on any of our statements. Otherwise, with nine people and three different questions or four different questions, we'll never get very far. And I'm only going to say a little bit to sort of frame this. The IGF, since the beginning of its existence, has been about digital cooperation. We haven't always called it that, but the names change, the times change, and such, but that has been. And in fact, from the very start, we said, and we have to be as good at digital cooperation as the internet has been at digital cooperation, something that Miriam re reminded us of at yesterday's opening. Um, all through its life, the, the IGF and the MAG have gotten various recommendations for how to improve, and they've always worked very hard to implement those as best they can. Now we have the roadmap and, and its follow-ons with more improvements, and uh, I think this conversation, basically the last question we'll ask is, 
okay, given that we understand what we understand, how is it going to happen? How is the IGF, the MAG, the uh, UN Technical Envoy, and all of that going to work together to make this happen? But we're going to start basically with various perspectives. And the first set of perspectives are from the people outside the roadmap. Not so much that they're outside the roadmap, they didn't draw the roadmap, they're on the road perhaps, but basically people who weren't part of putting it together, just looking at our line. And, and on that, I'd like to first go to Vint and basically ask for his perspective on the roadmap and digital cooperation, where are we going? Thanks so much, Avery. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me begin by suggesting to you that the internet is an artifact. It's a deliberately designed global and shared infrastructure. It bears some of the characteristics of other shared ecosystems like the atmosphere, the oceans, and space. Learning to maximize the utility of the internet while managing its risks is like training wheels on a bicycle. If we can develop common norms and international behavioral uh, agreements for the internet, we can apply these lessons to other more important sustainable development goals, many of which are aimed at shared and equally vital infrastructure. Secretary General Guterres' digital cooperation initiative is representative of this mindset, and it could not be more timely. The Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace, on which I sit, has proposed a variety of norms aimed at protecting the use of the internet and its users. Some actors advocate for policies that would fragment the internet and erode its global potential. The term data sovereignty is often invoked in aid of this argument. One understandable motivation for this argument is to achieve control of access to data, a concept adjacent to privacy. But this desirable protection can be achieved by other means that need not fragment the internet. At the proper levels in the internet's architecture, one can introduce cryptographic means to both enforce access control and to apply strong authentication to the identity of accessing parties and, in, and the integrity of the data. The free flow of data across borders is actually one of the most valuable aspects of the global internet. It's widely appreciated that the applications of the internet have simultaneously given rise to powerful collaborative capabilities, such as the development of a response to the global COVID-19 pandemic, and also opportunity for harmful and cross-border behaviors. It's no wonder that national safety security and security concerns have arisen. But to cope with the global system, one must apply global methods, and thus the call for digital cooperation extends to law enforcement and the apprehension of criminals. We have seen recently some very effective cooperation across national and international law enforcement agencies and the private sector in aid of such work, such as tracking down and apprehending ransomware hackers. These examples reinforce my belief that learning to work together to maintain and enhance the benefits of a global internet and increase safety and security in its use will inform our efforts in the other SDG domains. Let us go now and learn together to preserve our global, natural, and artificial habitats. Thank you, Aubrey. Thank you, Vid, for your comments. And now for a perspective, I'd like to go to Elke. Thank you, Avri, very much. And uh, first of all, thank you uh, for inviting me to this uh, very special panel. I'm very happy that I can share some of uh, my thoughts um, with you. Our digital initiatives are very much in line with the uh, UN Secretary's General Roadmap for Digital Cooperation and its main goal of making meaningful digital connections available for all. And we highly value its multi-stakeholder approach, where diverse institutions and organizations, especially in the development of the roadmap, it shapes the global perspective we need to have on digital transformation. So, for instance, the roadmap has been a relevant process to put uh, public um, digital goods on the political agenda. Let me please give you a short example from our work. Um, our engagement in the Digital Public Goods Alliance 
and our GovSlack initiatives uh, founded uh, with Estonia, the International Telecommunication Union, Smart Africa and the Digital Impact Alliance is very much uh, driven by the UN putting digital public goods on the map. I imagine the roadmap has certainly been also very helpful uh, to coordinate the efforts within the UN. And I would uh, wish for much more institutions and communities beyond UN to take inspiration in this roadmap and to use it as a tool for coordinated efforts um, and activities. But also, in order to make this roadmap a tool for cooperation, I would like to point out the transparency of results in the multi-stakeholder process and a further reflection about the question who is at the table will be very necessary. What I can see is that there is a lot of digital uh, cooperation outside the roadmap, be it, for example, a Smart Africa, are also initiatives uh, within the European Union. Digital cooperation does take place on many different levels, uh, but not yet in a very coherent way. But, uh, and uh, as we all know, roadmaps, hence documents, do only help to a certain extent. What we need are strong institutions uh, with sufficient resources and an inclusive governance model that ensures better coordination not only between states, uh, but also with private sector and uh, civil uh, society. Moreover, we need a mindset of co-creation and feedback as it is already, um, already integrated in the digital development principle. So to sum up, for a better internet governance, we need more than roadmaps and joint declarations or technical best standards uh, setting bodies. We need strong relationships, good partners, and fast and agile cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alke. And uh, very, very happy to hear the theme of we need a lot more cooperation when we're talking about digital cooperation and a roadmap to cooperation. So I very much appreciate that theme. Nena, next I come to you, um, somebody who's actually up here with me. And uh, so please, can we have your, your perspectives on our road to, to, on, on the, uh, the roadmap and to greater digital cooperation. Thank you very much, Audrey. Hello, everyone. I would not be reading a speech to you. I will speak from my heart, as always. And the first thing I want to say is congratulations to the people who are sitting up on the East Coast and the west coast of the US in this, um, in this session. Thank you for waking up early. It is the 8th of December today. It is the 16th edition of the IGF. Avery, yourself and myself, we've been here from PrepCon to WISIS. We lived through the digital solidarity days. Do you remember? Oh, do I sound better now? I'm sorry. I wanted to say hello to those who woke up early. And I was saying that we are on the, on the 8th of December today. And we've come a long way. We've come a long way from the preparatory days of the WASIS, the WASIS, the digital solidarity. We've done 16 years of Internet Governance Forum. I personally have done it globally, continentally, and nationally. And so we've come a long way. At the World Wide Web Foundation, this is our fourth year of digital cooperation. So we've been there since the high-level panel that gave us a report. And we've been there at the launch of the roadmap. We welcomed the formation of the Office of the UN Tech Envoy. And we have seen the launch of uh, something called our common agenda. And so my first and initial submission today is that digital cooperation is only a subset of the digital ecosystem. I'm glad that Vincent spoke before me. Uh, there is a whole lot of things happening out there in the digital ecosystem that doesn't come under the purview of the roadmap. And that is very important for us to understand. The digital cooperation roadmap only has eight pillars. And so as civil society, 
as the World Wide Web Foundation, we are not satisfied. It is important to note that. It is only a subset of our issues. But as they say, the UN only steps in when countries and its member states cannot sort out the problem themselves. So I believe that the UN is not there to make us happy, but to make us equally unhappy. And so unhappy as we are, we are going to forge along with digital cooperation, and now we have a roadmap. We've been working on the roadmap on global connectivity. We see that a lot of things have been left out, but it is better than having nothing at all. And so we want to congratulate the work that the ASG, Spatolisano, has been doing, despite restricted um, resources. But then I want to leave my final word with everyone. The World Wide Web was created, invented, and given to humanity for two reasons, to be for everyone and to be for good. And the part of everyone is the one I want to bring in here. And that is what, why the Web Foundation has dedicated a whole NENA to digital cooperation. And so part of my work is digital cooperation. If you want to know what digital cooperation looks like in human form, that's the person speaking. I'm a West African woman from the global south, and I'm going to be here on digital cooperation every day. That's my commitment. And make sure that everyone, every voice will be heard. Whatever plan of digital cooperation is going to come out, either from the USG's office or from digital cooperation office, I will be there. So my commitment and the commitment of the Web Foundation is the same commitment of Web we want, that it will be for everyone. And until then, you will have me. Thank you. Thank you. An, an iconic speech. So hopefully the, the, the USG office perhaps will have, you know, a, a icon to look at and sort of say, this is what we are heading for. This is what we are looking for. And perhaps. Um, so next I go to Justin and uh, comments on perspectives from outside the roadmap. Uh, good morning, and, and certainly a hard act to follow. Um, but i um, happy to be with you all this morning discussing this important issue. Um, these are timely conversations, uh, and not just at the global level. I, I work at the US State Department, where recently um, uh, our secretary announced a plan to reorganize our various cyber and digital offices into a more coherent structure that allows the United States to better coordinate and collaborate on cyber and digital uh, cooperation issues in our diplomacy. Um, and you know, I'm sure other organizations around the world are going through that similar process, and so it makes sense that the United Nations is doing that as well. Uh, and we certainly need that same kind of foresight and thinking at the global level about how we organize to respond to these current challenges, uh, but also take advantage of the, of the opportunities. And so global digital cooperation um, rooted in an inclusive and multi-stakeholder approach uh, is essential to ensure the internet and digital uh, technologies continue to be a force for good around the world. Uh, and these are some of the key policy issues of our time, and we, and we need to get them right. Um, but it's also important to take stock, <clears throat> take stock of <clears throat> the process over even just the past year on some of these issues, including within the United Nations system. Uh, the ITU just released a report about global connectivity, which had some concerns that needed to still be addressed. But there was also some good news about the growth uh, since over the last couple of years in global connectivity. Uh, the UN's OEWG and GGE both produced consensus reports. Earlier this year, um, the UN member states have agreed to a process to develop uh, a global cybercrime treaty and several, really far too many to list, uh, UN entities from the Security Council to UNGA to the Human Rights Council to subsidiary bodies and commissions and specialized agencies have incorporated digital technology work into their work plans uh, and produced some really important outcomes uh, this past year, um, you know, which it, in the work plans in general, but also in response to a global pandemic. Um, so there's a well, and then who we are at another IGF having a wealth of conversations. And that's just in the UN, and I know many here are also involved in all these same, uh, similar conversations happening at national, regional, multi-stakeholder, in the NRIs, industry events, civil society events. 
Um, so digital cooperation on the one hand is, is I think fairly alive and well. There is a wealth of activity out there happening. And so the question for us then becomes, where are there gaps? Uh, what is not being done? What can be done better? Uh, and then also, how do we capture all of this good work that is happening, but is often just not uh, shared or percolating up to policymakers or decision makers in various ways? And so I think in this regard, the, the roadmap uh, has, has highlighted some of the areas that we can continue to improve, uh, whether that be on uh, redoubling our efforts on uh, global connectivity and access, uh, enhancing digital inclusion. Um, you know, we think that it importantly, it focuses on, um, you know, the shared values that many of us have, including human rights, fundamental freedoms, uh, and that this work should be done through multi-stakeholder efforts. Um, and then, of, co of course, I think it importantly highlighted the central role of the IGF in that process and how the IGF has, uh, over the years, taken this very important central role on how these conversations come together and should be part uh, of the UN's digital cooperation work going forward. So um, I'll stop there for now and okay. save other comments for later. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, great comment. And our last voice in this particular section on the outside perspectives uh, is uh, Anita. So please. Thank you, Avi. One cannot disagree with the semantic categories of the Secretary General's report. From digital inclusion to human rights, it's all there. But the core problem diagnostic about what exactly ails our interconnected world, unfortunately, falls short. This means the solution simply misses the point. In 2018, the Secretary General appointed a high-level panel co-chaired by Jack Ma and Melinda French Gates to advise him. Their report, on which the Secretary General's report is based, identifies the lack of trust and humility as the key problem preventing effective multi-stakeholder cooperation. Multi-stakeholderism does not fail because of lack of humility or trust. It fails because in a fundamentally unequal world, the materially strongest nodes of the network will dominate the overall network. In any such network with no clear lines of responsibility, it's impossible to hold any actor accountable for any particular governance failure. So we turn to the unfortunate blind spot in the Secretary General's report, the ordinary story of extraordinary power of transnational digital corporations whose primary stake in digital cooperation is about ensuring the status quo. Meaningful global dialogue for the realization of digital inclusion or human rights is about fixing responsibility. Sanitized of the means to moderate power, multi-stakeholderism retains no connections to the claims and entitlements of people. It also distracts attention from the responsibility and legitimacy of states in digital governance. The specific proposals in the Secretary General's roadmap do not clarify any binding mechanisms. Instead, they propose a high-level body to address urgent issues supported by private finance and offering membership based on financial contributions. As the JustNet Coalition's open letter to the UN Secretary General signed by over 170 civil society groups notes, we face the incredulous prospect of a big tech-led body for the governance of big tech. That too at the precise moment when the EU and the Biden administration and many governments in the South, including mine, are stepping up the public policy process for stringent regulation of big tech. The inspiring vision of the UN Secretary General's recent report, A Common Agenda, falters similarly. The document calls for a global digital compact and strengthening the governance of the global digital commons and public goods. However, it contains no recommendations for a newly new legally binding intergovernmental treaty or directions to enhance the implementation of the international rule of law vis-a-vis -vis emerging digital public goods. On the contrary, it argues this, that this does not require any new institutions. Coming on the heels of the UNCTAD Digital Economy Report 2021, which has observed the need for a new institutional setup to meet the global data governance challenge, this is indeed surprising. We confront a postmodern dystopia, a collective future based on a non-approach to global governance without political leadership or accountability, 
based on voluntary actions by various actors where vocabularies coalesce around the high ideals of rights and inclusion, and yet the road to cooperation does little to address injustice or exploitation. It's nothing short of a tragic paradox that the mandate of the United Nations for decolonizing of territories is being reconfigured to enable a new digital colonialism. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I very much appreciate the range that we had in, in our speakers from those who sort of support it, those who are willing to go along with it, and those that see it as flawed. Sort of the perfect distribution for a panel. Now I would like to uh, go on to perspectives from the UN and from MAG members or ex-MAG members. And the first person I go to is Jean-Paul. You're, you're now, I don't think you're... We need to move it forward. Yeah, it's, it's to the top. Okay, all right, thank you. So as you can see, uh, technology is always challenging whether you are in-person or virtual. But thank you so much, Avery, and thank you for all the perspectives we've heard already. And I think, first of all, I'm, I'm speaking from the perspective of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa and the support that we're bringing to African countries to address digital cooperation. Unfortunately, we have to recognize that in Africa, governance of the internet is something which is experienced rather than led. Um, in most situations, African countries have limited agency in terms of the governance of the, of the internet. And one of the key elements that we hope we can achieve through this roadmap and certainly through the interventions being done by the United Nations is to improve this element of agency for developing countries, particularly uh, in Africa. So despite the significant progress in terms of internet access this, that has been achieved in Africa, it is still well below and well behind the global average. And what we have seen in the context of the pandemic is also uh, an aggravation of the inequalities of access. So to fully be able to harness the potential of digital technologies, we need to look at digital cooperation from the perspective of inclusion, of ensuring that there is affordable, reliable, secure, and safe access uh, to the internet. This also means uh, democratizing access, strengthening connectivity, funding infrastructure, improving digital skills, and having a fair and safe regulatory environment. We should note that, in, that good quality internet uh, will require, uh, and to have access for all of these people in terms of broadband infrastructure, will require investment of at least 100 billion US dollars. And that does require an appropriate regulatory environment that will facilitate that. In terms of the work of the Economic Commission for Africa, we have launched the high-level panel on digital cooperation, which is aimed particularly at implementing the African Digital Transformation Strategy. And this is being done jointly with the African Union uh, Commission. And the strategic uh, aims of this framework are in facilitating innovation for transformation of the African economy, and particularly building on the opportunity of the African continental free trade area, and using networks for cooperation such as Smart Africa, which are aimed at precisely bringing investment into key infrastructure to improve the, this investment in, in internet uh, infrastructures. The Economic Commission of Africa and the Better Than Cash Alliance also launched a dialogue series on digital cooperation to share experiences and good practices. And I think one of the opportunities in Africa is that a lot of the innovation is being driven by necessity. A lot of the inclusion around access to, for example, e-commerce is being driven by payment platforms. And we're continuing to see that in the context of the AFCFTA. And therefore, the regulatory framework around this is going to be very important. Uh, the Economic Commission of Africa is also trying to address the issue of access, even among those that don't have the regular access to the internet uh, currently and develop those skills through an African Girls Can Code initiative, which is a training platform across the continent, which offers uh, introduction to ICT skills for African women and girl girls. In the context of COVID, we have also seen the use of uh, online platforms such as the African uh, COVID-19 Information Platform, 
or ASIP, which has aimed to use existing mobile infrastructure to connect people uh, in a way that is useful and realistic for daily users. And this is the kind of example of cooperation that can be achieved on the African continent uh, by working on digital cooperation through the African Digital Transformation Strategy. And finally, also, we have seen, uh, in terms of responding to COVID, the opportunity to develop uh, procurement platforms for medical supplies, which have demonstrated the ability to connect uh, producers and manufacturers in Africa with the procurement teams, both within Africa and beyond, and creating more opportunities uh, in terms of the, the real economy. Um, over $70 million worth of merchandise are being processed under this medical supplies platform, empowering African producers, but also creating real uh, solutions to the immediate problems of addressing COVID-19. And in conclusion, I think one of the key elements around digital cooperation is being able to empower uh, governments by giving them the right information to be able to act in a way which really addresses the needs of their populations. And therefore, looking at e-government indicators is going to be one of the, the facilitators to allow uh, governments and uh, uh, organizations to properly allow digital cooperation to flourish and achieve the, the levels of access and inclusion that we want to see. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And quickly, I'd like to go to uh, Raul, who has basically been there since with the IGF since before there was one. So please, Raul. <laughs> Thank you, Avery. Thank you, uh, every, the organizers, uh, for the opportunity to participate. And, and hi, everybody, to my colleagues, prestigious uh, speakers in this session. Uh, I think that, as Nena pointed out uh, when she spoke, I have been around from the, the time of the preparatory meetings of uh, WISIS. So yes, we have seen a lot. Um, okay, let's uh, start with the three things that I see um, as the, the, the main motivations for this, uh, for doing something on digital cooperation. We are seeing a lot of pressing issues in terms of development and policy and digital policy issues uh, coming up every day in different parts of the world and many times the, we are speaking about the same things and there are uh, multiple discussions about the same things in, in different places. But second point is that there is a, a, a huge disconnection between the, the multiple international discussions so we, we hold in uh, different forums and the daily policy makings in each of the countries. Okay. Um, my third point is that there is a perception sometimes, maybe it's an, an illusion, but uh, until we don't prove that it's wrong, there is a, a perception that sometimes we could uh, uh, get uh, agreements um, on some um, issues, but we don't have the, the right mechanisms to conduct the discussions toward those uh, possible agreements. So, based on those uh, three points, <clears throat> the natural conclusion is that we have to do something. And the, the U.S. Secretary General has taken responsibilities on, on, on this, <clears throat> and has, I think that's the, the he has read correctly the, the, the concerns from the international community, from the member states, um, and he took the, the, the leadership on conducting this, uh, this uh, process on digital cooperation. Uh, this is an imperfect process, of course, and of course, the, if the process is imperfect, as well as the, 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 are the solutions. Uh, probably because what Nena said, that the role of the UN is not make not to make happy everybody, but to make uh, uh, equally happy everybody. So maybe that's the reason. Um, sometimes uh, it's a little frustrating because the process are very long, and so we just uh, <laughs> make uh, baby steps. And uh, when we when we see a light on the end of the tunnel, and we think that we are close to arrive to some uh, valuable conclusions. We discovered that around the corner there is a new process, and new forums, and new discussions. Um, but uh, but this is the way that the international um, so the cooperation works. And uh, so we have to be optimistic at this moment. This is the moment uh, to be optimistic and to, uh, to suspend this belief and to commit all of us trying to 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 do something different. One key issue here is that the. The, the UN has to understand that they don't have to solve everything. 
they just have to pay the way to facilitate uh, better cooperation between all the among all the stakeholders um, and there is a, a huge responsibility from the UN side to bring on board the right people from the government from the public uh, uh, sector that to ensure that the, 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 the discussions we have in this uh, these new mechanisms have impact on the daily issues um, we need some concrete achievements in the in the short term uh, because what I said before, that there is uh, sometimes is, uh, those processes are a little frustrating. And we need to achieve something and to move ahead to, and to, to claim some, um, some wins. And of course, the, the multi-stakeholder model should continue being the basis of uh, any solution uh, in, in a way that permit to, to take advantage of the highly distributed in every sense, uh, geographically, by different sectors, but highly distributed, it's a knowledge, perspective, and expertise. And of course, for the benefit of everybody. Because the ultimate, uh, the ultimate objective, as always, is to, to build together a better world. Uh, some of us are convinced that digital development is uh, central, is key for human, social, and economic development. And of course, digital governance and digital cooperation should play an, an important role in ensuring that, that we achieve those objectives of, of building a better world, taking advantage of the digital development. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raul. At this point, I'd like to uh, check with Sook Young to check and see whether there have been any comments in the chat or such that you wouldn't yes, bring out. Thank you. Um, there was one question on um, how does the SG see the links between the Global Digital Compact and the role of the TE's office and the IHF other relevant processes? What is will be the role of the TE's office with the Global Digital Compact? But I suggest that we maybe uh, post this question a little bit later because we will have an input from um, from the UN on the global um, compact, digital compact later, right? Yep. Okay. So uh, no other questions or um, comments in the chat, but maybe Henriette or Avi or Wind is raising his hand. Right. If it's okay. okay. Yes, Wind, if it's a very brief thing. I have not been a good moderator in terms of keeping time yet, so please help me because I do want to get to Maria Francesca's comments that are responding to all our perspectives. Uh, in, well, I, I wanted to react to uh, Raoul's comments because I thought they were uh, spot on. Uh, the thing that I particularly wanted to observe is that in my participation in the IGF, one of the most useful sessions has been with legislators uh, and uh, bringing them into the discussion uh, for me, anyway, it was very useful because they have a perspective that uh, the technologists like me don't necessarily have. And so I'd like to encourage increasing participation in IGF processes among the legislative community. Thank you. And in fact, I think this IGF has had parliamentarians and legislators, so it's really good. Okay. Um, thank you, Sukyun. Thank you uh, for being very brief, Fint. And uh, I'd like to pass the You've heard lots of perspectives, so please. Okay, thank you uh, for having me and uh, thank you for all these uh, in perspectives and input that I am absorbing as much as I can. The IGF is very important also for this. Uh, so the, the question, I think, is about the Global Digital Compact, basically, and the office of the tech envoy. And what can we expect from uh, this proposal and this initiative? Uh, let me, if you give me, how many minutes you give me? You Three? Five. five, but you've used ah. four. <laughs> four, okay. Four will be enough to explain, I think, in a nutshell. So let me do a step backwards and remind everybody that last year was the 75th anniversary of the UN, and we celebrated by asking everybody what they think, what they want the UN to be, and a million people, over a million people, answered the 
the surveys and the consultations, and we had uh, a lot of work to do sorting out, you know, and, and sifting through all this rich input. Uh, membership also read it very carefully and then um, condensed, if you want, uh, through negotiation into a political declaration, a document on the commemoration of the 75th anniversary, where in one paragraph uh, uh, they wrote that we must, and I quote, we must ensure safe and affordable digital access for all. The United Nations can provide a platform for all stakeholders to participate in such deliberations. So I think this really addresses what we are discussing here. We want access for all, we want everybody to participate, and the UN is a platform. I could stop here, but I won't. I will continue <laughs> and, and tell you that, of course, on the basis of this declaration, the, the system, the UN structure, started elaborating how to do that. And uh, uh, the result, if you want, is in the vision of the Secretary General, the report we call Our Common Agenda, which was presented in September this year. And it is a very broad report. It contains over uh, 90-90 proposals in all areas of action of the UN. For what is of digital cooperation, um, I have to say we are blessed with a lot of work uh, because uh, the, the digital cooperation, as many of the panelists already said, is, uh, is a tool, is a means which can help to reach other SDGs, is a, is a cross-cutting uh, element of our uh, future and we have to get it right. So there is a lot there uh, regarding the digital cooperation and the internet. But basically it says that it is a global public good and that there has to be, you know, a contribution which brings uh, a, a process which, uh, um, through multi-stakeholderism, brings uh, to some agreement in a document. We called it a global digital compact. The Secretary General proposes that we all collectively work to create this uh, consensus around basic principles and uh, that the Office of the Tech Envoy will coordinate this preparation. But this preparation will be based on the, as I said, the inputs of all the UN system and all the multi-stakeholders. And there is no draft. We start from scratch. Let's be clear about this. This is why IGF is so important. Other venues will also be called to feed this process. And we will uh, progress we hope progress together. So the common agenda suggests, indicates some areas to include in this compact. As I said, first of all, the connecting all people to the internet, universal connectivity. Second, and it was also mentioned, avoid internet fragmentation. Also protecting data, people's data. Apply human rights online as we do offline introduce, and I come to the criticism, introduce accountability criteria at least for content, misleading content, fake news, harassment online, all the harm which can be uh, vehiculated through these tools. And then also promote regulation of artificial intelligence and, as I mentioned already, treat the digital common as a public good, a global public good. So this is a tall order. You all understand it's not easy. But we are uh, set to do this, and we hope to do it as using uh, the existing uh, uh, venues, uh, resources like the IGF. The multi-stakeholder nature of the IGF makes it a perfect uh, uh, you know, building block to, to look into the future, the digital future we want and uh, also using uh, the various NRIs that uh, exist in this context will be very important. Uh, so I think that for now I will stop here Thank and you. I hope this addresses a little bit of the questions which were Thank asked. You. Thank you. A, a good next step in the conversation, so thank you. And uh, next I've got a quick question to both Vint and then to Nana, which was, and this is a gut question. I don't know if you do gut questions, but this is a gut question. 
is, do you think that the compact, as described, as to be developed, do you think it will have a positive effect? In fact, the question I was given was, do you think it will have a huge positive effect? But just telling me no whether you think it'll have an effect or a positive one would be good enough. Um, <laughs> sorry, for advancing digital cooperation. In other words, to the two of you who were both kind of in the, yeah, let's work with it kind of attitude, if I can describe it, and please, if I describe it wrong, tell me. What do you think? Vint, please. Well, uh, I'm uh, by nature optimistic, uh, and I believe in principles. And I think that if we start from uh, a belief that we want to preserve the utility of the internet, and the systems that have grown on top of it, including all those that are uh, facilitated by the World Wide Web, uh, we have to start with a set of principles whose adoption will lead to the kind of network that we all want, which is open, uh, safe, and secure, and all those other wonderful uh, adjectives. Uh, I think um, I am in favor of working in this, in this way, uh, as opposed to ignoring the problem and, and having everything get worse. So uh, it seems to me that uh, this, is, this is an agenda we should be pursuing. Thank you, Vint. And Nana, same question to you. UN work is boring work. So I, I, I foresee that the Global Digital Compact is going to be boring. <laughs> yeah, that's my, that's my gut feeling. I also foresee that it will be equally uh, unsatisfactory to all parties because I would never get enough and governments will think that they've given too much. However, every, after WISIS and Tunis agenda, we've not had any global kind of agreement. And so I think it is a breakthrough. I believe in find solutions or keep quiet. And since I've decided not to keep quiet, we are going to find solutions together. I've retired from optimism and pessimism. I just want to be realist. And so we're going to get in there. If we need to fight Maria Francesca, we will do it. But then the Global Digital Compact is ours. Yes, we do believe that we are part of the Global Digital Compact and our voices need to be heard. So halfway, halfway, but now is the time to get in there and make it what we want it to be. If you are not going to be part of the solution, keep quiet. Aha. Uh -huh. That's why I've been quiet all these years. <laughs> um, next, um, I, I wanted to go and ask, having heard that, having seen what we've got, what changes do we need? And I have a programmatic set of questions that I've been given. What changes do we need in order to advance digital cooperation? Perhaps in addition to this, perhaps part of this, perhaps instead of this. And, and in order to make a new model a success. So there's a presumption of the need for a new model, but what changes do we need? Is this the change or that? And Elke, I'd like to go to you first. Uh, sorry, uh, unmuting was just a problem. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, let me address the question from uh, maybe two different sides. Um, first of all, I think this is also what we heard right now, collaboration between public and private sector, uh, governments and international organizations is not always easy and therefore also uh, not really makes everybody happy. Particular interests of certain groups or regions make it very difficult to establish a common ground uh, for the cooperation. And if you find common ground, uh, we all experience that it's uh, very often a very general nature that cannot be easily translated into implementation, or um, it is uh, within a strong framework, be it regional or specifically, in, specifically interested driven. Um, uh, uh, this works quite well um, in comparison uh, to cooperation of a very general and global level. This is also how we approach it, and we currently deal, therefore, with a lot of issues where policy approaches and decision-making often takes place under this great uh, uncertainty we also already heard of. And um, we are um, only related uh, to a limited questions and or regions. 
And for example, the uh, design of a digital ID application is relevant to every country worldwide. It's not effective if every country designs its own solution. This is uh, where cooperation formats like, for example, the Digital Public Goods Alliance uh, come into play. And to navigate uh, this difficult question, uh, we took a regional approach, for example. We have made very good experiences uh, with the networks and alliances, for example, like Smart Africa, we also heard um, before, and uh, that are assembling private sector players and ICT ministries under one roof. This is maybe from the one side. Um, and the other side, as an implementing agency, we have um, also to rethink our ways of uh, cooperation. Every digital solution has to be problem driven and developed in an iterative approach. This uh, iterative approach is a challenge uh, to our existing procedures of project uh, development and planning, especially also taking into account the increasing measures securing compliance in the recent years. Moreover, learning with evidence driven feedback also needs to be encouraged and built into regular management uh, that allows for real time adaption. And finally, we need to look deeper into why some stakeholders put a lot of effort in engaging and some might not. Um, and I would also like to raise the question beyond intrinsic motivations of individuals. What are the incentives for engaging? Because working and putting uh, personal efforts consumes time and uh, resources. So ending up, uh, it is my strong belief that the greatest success comes from joint efforts that we are keen to collaborate in new models of digital cooperation. Whether in Europe, where digital cooperation between the Team Europe and its global partners is fostered through the D4D hub, or globally, where the UN could strengthen its role uh, for coordinating efforts. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And same question to you, Milton. Three minutes, please. All right. Is this uh, mic on? Yep. OK. Yep. So what changes do we need to advance digital cooperation in some ways that is easy to say, but of course hard to do. So more digital cooperation will happen when the world's major state powers are ready to cooperate. This is the elephant in the room that nobody in the UN likes to talk about. Um, by ready to cooperate, I mean ready to stop engaging in intrusive forms of cyber espionage ready to stop seeing trade in information and communication technology as a national security threat, ready to stop building walls around their digital economies and their citizens' access to information. In other words, I'm saying that digital cooperation is not more of an effect than a cause, and you would advance it by addressing the sources of digital conflict. And in order to get progress on that, uh, instead of these grand goals, like everybody is gonna have broadband internet access in the most remote parts of the world, um, which is actually going to be something that happens in, in the market rather than through the UN. Uh, you need to break problems down into smaller, more focused problem areas, or what we call policy problems in, in my discipline of public policy studies. So an example of that would be uh, the cybersecurity problems related to trade in telecom and computer equipment, right? Uh, like the Huawei US controversy. Can't we work out agreed mechanisms to support trust that would allow uh, free trade and uh, competition in, uh, in 5G equipment, for example? Why can't we, why can't we cooperate on that? Uh, what about competition and trade and information services? Why, why doesn't China trust uh, you know, Google and Facebook and other platforms to actually be available in their economies? And why is the U.S. starting to uh, question whether TikTok and other Chinese companies can be present in their market? Can we focus on that area and work something out? And on the relationship of these trade and information services to privacy is another focused area where maybe the U.S., Europe, and China can work out uh, common mechanisms and standards for protecting uh, the data of individual users of the internet. Thank you. And next I have Justin. And seems like a coincidental timing, but please, Justin. 
Thank you. Yeah, um, I think first uh, I, I was an engineer in a previous life, and the first step in uh, to solve an engineering problem is to define the problem and what tools you have to, to, to solve it. And I think we need to do the same thing here. Um, what, what are we trying to solve? <clears throat> and then are those solutions that we've identified actually focused on solving those problems? Uh, I've been working on these, or tracking these digital cooperation issues for a few years now, and it seems to mean a little something different to everyone. And I think we're going to need to, as we move forward, really hone um, what we're trying to do, uh, use more precise language, and ensure that we're focused on the same problems. If digital cooperation becomes, um, uh, use an American analogy, a Christmas tree, whereby everybody is trying to hang all their priorities, uh, it may make it very hard to get any outcome, and then any outcome we do get would probably be very diluted and it, it may not be impactful in the way folks want it to. So more precise language, I think, would be helpful. Um, which takes me also to my second point. I think we need to be careful about magic bullet thinking. Uh, some of the most fruitful UN fora on these issues over the years took, took time to develop breakthrough, and they had fairly narrowly defined mandates. Um, now, that's not an excuse for inaction or lack of ambition or lack of a sense of urgency, but it does highlight the need for focus and pragmatism and real, realistic expectations in how we move forward on some of these issues. Um, you know, it's probably very unlikely that we can just flip over to some new governance model or architecture or agree to a, a resolution or declaration or something that's going to address all of our, the challenges uh, in, in the digital age. Um, you know, we need a more balanced approach uh, and ensure that we are, um, you know, taking lessons learned from the past and um, focusing those on the problems of the present. Um, and then finally, I think that um, a lot of what the UN can do on digital cooperation to be effective is help strengthen and elevate the tools we have, including the level of participation in the existing forum like the IGF, uh, help ensure that this and other processes are transparent, inclusive, properly resourced, um, and then help elevate and champion all the important work that is happening uh, in the IGF, inside uh, other parts of the UN, outside the UN, so that information is available and useful uh, and informing policy makers, decision makers, makers and users around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the last person on this particular question I'll go to is Raul. So Raul, what do you think's needed? Thank you, Evelyn. Um, okay, when, when we created all together, we created the IGF. Um, I realized it not only at the beginning, but uh, the following years that uh, we had created probably the most innovative thing that has happened in the, in the international um, scenario, international cooperation for many decades. Um, but uh, I, I still think that, but of course we are now facing the, the, the need of a new, uh, new round of innovation. So we need to go to the next step now. And of course, including the IGF, because it is uh, too early to, to let the IGF uh, go out. So still, we can take advantage of IGF uh, for many, many years. But we need something, and I think that's aligned with what other colleagues have already said. I, need, uh, I think that we need some mechanisms to, to uh, um, arrive to some high-level principles related to the most uh, uh, pressing issues, and some general frames to address those things. I'm, I'm not, um, I don't think that we need to, to uh, we need something to develop uh, um, binding solutions, not at all, but yes, uh, mechanisms that allow us in a multi-stakeholder fashion to, uh, to arrive to some high-level ideas, uh, frames, and, and principles to address the, 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 the problems that or the challenges uh, we, we face. So we need to identify what are the things are set in the agenda internationally and bring many people on board to discuss that. I know that many people is skeptical in, with regard to, the, to arriving to, those, uh, uh, to this common ground. I, I want to remember that three days before the WC summit in Tunis, it seemed absolutely impossible to get an agreement. 
And in three days, uh, we focused on, on developing, on finding, identifying the common ground, and we did it. So always, it is, it is always possible to, to find some kind of common ground. And we have to optimize. We need mechanisms that allow us to optimize the, this, uh, the, the, the building of the common ground. One thing that is very important is that we need to bring many, many people on board, everybody, to have really solutions that impact globally in the policy making. We need to involve everybody. And I'm afraid that sometimes, and as I, as I said in my first intervention, the, the processes are a little frustrating, are very long, very complicated, and we lose a lot of people on the way. And this is the opposite of what we need. So we need to make things easier and more simple to, uh, to everybody to participate. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raul. Uh, the next is, I wanted to check with you, uh, Sokyung, to uh, check and see whether there's any comments that you've been picking up uh, in the chat that you wanted to bring forward. Yeah, thank you very much. There is a lot of huge con uh, agreement on, on the need for shared principles. And there was one question from Amir Mukaberi um, that he sent to me. And I would encourage Amir, if you are here with us, to raise your question directly. Okay. I don't see a hand up. Or is it a person in the room that would just get a microphone? You, oh, I see the hand. Yes, please. Um, on the aisle, about halfway. Yes, you've seen. Um, very well um, articulated you know, points from uh, our moderators. My name is Keith Andere. I am the coordinator for the Africa Youth IGF. And I really like the conversation about uh, the digital cooperation that is currently ongoing. However, I don't see anyone looking at the youth angle into this conversation because I think we are leaving young people behind and they're the key players who will make this digital cooperation work. And I really want to see what are some of the strategies, um, ECA, you know, for example, because Africa is a youthful continent, continent and also within the office of the uh, Secretary General, what are some of the strategies to plug in young people Thank you. Thank you very much. And yes, as I look around the, the, the panel, first at myself in the mirror, and then at the rest of my colleagues, hopefully I'm not insulting any of them, none of us is youth, and it is remiss that, that we didn't have a youth. So thank you for speaking up. Um, and we really got to do better at that. I, 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 yep, we really got to do better at that. Respond to that question. Would you like to respond? If you'd like. Th thank you very much, sir. I don't think we are that old. It's just that we've been <laughs> engaged for some, <laughs> for some time. Um, it's really very important that we go away, first of all, from multilateralism, in which um, UN member states get together and do things. I think that is one of the reasons why we are here. But please also allow me in your thinking to say, Madam Moderator, we need to go beyond the normal IGF crowd. Mm -hmm. Because the normal IGF crowd is the one that will get connected to Indico and register and get a PCR test and fly. You basically need a passport. Everyone who attends IGF has a passport and can fly planes, right? No. We have hybrid. Good. Every or then you connect online. You you need a good connectivity. You need the right device that can do voice. You actually need a fast connection to be able um, to to get connected. And so what we have proposed, um, we are proposing. Uh, ASG, is that we go beyond these people. In fact, we go beyond the people who are connected. We go to the unconnected people and said, and, and, and explain what global digital cooperation is and what the vision that led to the launch of the global digital compact is and ask them, what, what one, two, three things do you want to see? And we our engagement at the Web Foundation is that this does not just happen in Paris, New York, and London. 
but it also happens in Senegal, in Djibouti, in, in Bangladesh, in Sudan, in Tanzania, in the places where people are mostly offline. So in one sentence, uh, Mr. Youngman is not only the youth that are marginalized, there are quite a number of other marginalized communities, and that's why we say everyone, not everybody, because people whose bodies are not complete also have a voice. Thank you. Um, and, and I'm really hoping that we can do it this time. I remember that over 10 years ago and beyond, we were going to reach out to the unconnected. It was always part of our mantra, the connected and the unconnected. We haven't done it yet, so I wish us luck. Uh, Rapol, you wanted to say something. Thank you very much, Avery, and uh, again, a, a, a great uh, question. Uh, and the, the, the internet is supposed to be a tool for, for inclusion, but the reality is that, particularly in Africa, it, uh, and the pandemic has shown it, it, it remains relatively unequal in terms of access, and uh, one of the key issues as well is affordability. So I think a lot of the regulatory aspects should not only be uh, top to bottom, but bottom up. So it's really about hearing the expectations of uh, particularly uh, young people, um, women and girls, often who are, uh, don't have a seat at the table. And the, uh, uh, in, in that uh, regard, some of the work that uh, uh, is being done is about ensuring that there is capacity building, and that's one of the pillars of the African Union digital transformation strategy, because ensuring that there is awareness and understanding of how to make use of, for example, uh, digital connectivity uh, to be able to earn a living in terms of developing entrepreneurship, uh, build a, a company is, is, is a key element. And then the digital ID uh, element, which is a part of the compact, is something which uh, has to be developed uh, in, in a way which is not only about how governments connect with their citizens, but about ensuring that all citizens are able to connect and make use of those services. And then the final point I would make is in relation to emerging sectors, We've talked about artificial intelligence, the need for regulation, and one of the things that we're trying to do in Africa is make sure that these emerging sectors are brought closer, for example, to young people through a, an African regional center on artificial intelligence, which is being set up in Congo. Thank you. Thank you. And now, I wanted to check. Uh, Amir Mokaberi, I see a hand raised. Is that a hand from before, or is that, is that you? No. Uh, um, hello, can you hear me? Can yes, hear me? Is, that, is that you? Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, for giving me the floor and this opportunity to share my comments on uh, digital cooperation uh, architecture. Uh, hello, everyone, and distinguished panelists. Uh, my question is that uh, don't you think that to promote trust and to shaping civilian, peaceful, and development-oriented uh, internet rather than new battlefield and militarized zone, the world needs to establish a charity-based civilian international organization for cyberspace management so that uh, we could structure the digital cooperation for all layers, like data governance, data uh, standardization, Digital standardization, online safety, and cybersecurity. So, uh, I'm referring to something like the International Civilian uh, Civil Aviation Organization. I would like to suggest uh, the establishment of I um, ECAO like organization for Inter. I would like to know the view of distinguished panelists on this uh, suggestion. And, uh, uh, and also, I would like to mention a vital issue regarding nature and characteristic of good internet. What is the good internet? Before going forward and before discussing about digital cooperation, we should first define the nature and characteristic of good internet and good digital space. What kind of internet and cyberspace we are going to shape and globalize a good uh, a vision of good internet as a civilian only and development oriented environment for militarized and unstable internet and new battlefield for cyber warfare at level, which one, which region? 
Uh, Thank you. Uh, yeah, good questions. Uh, excuse me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How could we want to put digital economy and digital trade uh, and communication between nations on such an unstable and rough uh, environment? Don't you think that a global declaration by all member states to recognize the internet as a civilian space only for peaceful purposes and global public good could help achieving this goal? Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very what much. You you've yeah, you've, you, you, you've given you. many points for people to think about, and perhaps as we go forward, some parts will be touched upon. I thank want. You very much. Yeah, thank you. I certainly don't have an answer for you. It's uh, quite a philosophical set of thoughts that, that would be hard for me. Um, so I wanted to move to the next section because I do believe we're running on time, or well, actually running behind time. And uh, the, um, the, the last question I had, which was, how can the IGF adapt innovate and reform itself to advance global digital cooperation and what role should the IGF play in advancing global digital cooperation? And the first person I have is Maria Francesca and then I'll go to Anita and Milton. And please look at our time and be frugal. <laughs> yes, indeed, thank you, Ari. And uh, um, if I you know, have understood the uh, and uh, correctly uh, taken into the, the comments made in this uh, second part of our exchanges. I think I heard many encouraging voices uh, telling us, yes, we have to start with a set of principles. It won't be perfect, but it is good to have a common ground. And it might be boring, as Nana said, but it is going to be ours and we will uh, work on it. And uh, and I'm very encouraged by this. And I thank you for these comments. But I also heard others who said, okay, principles, enough, UN, please be concrete, be focused, don't, uh, you know, uh, be, don't use your broad language that leads nowhere, etc." So I want to address that point because I mentioned the content of the um, common agenda and the, the set of principles which uh, would inspire this document. But I also need to add, that we hope that together with those principles, we will have also coalition of proposal and actions which would implement those principles or at least to start implement those principles. So um, it's not just theory that we want to put together, we want also to have action. Uh, I didn't mention it before because, of course, it's, again, very ambitious and I don't want to raise expectations. We have to work on that. We have to work together. And now I come to your question, the role of the IGF. The IGF can do many things in this respect. It can be, and it is, an important meeting point where you elaborate ideas. But I wonder also if it shouldn't be or become or trend towards being a meeting point where you can also start uh, testing uh, uh, concrete uh, cooperation, you know, pilot actions, uh, coalitions of uh, voluntary natures whereby those principles can be then brought uh, to the real world. So I, I dare saying that you might want to think along those lines as well. And then there are many other things IGF can do um, to, as the word uh, uh, says, adapt, innovate, and reform itself. You, you have started already by straight, uh, uh, streamlining the agendas and focusing you know, around some themes, and this is very important. The timely, timeliness of the issues uh, uh, that can, can be discussed is, uh, is essential. Uh, we also have... Uh, uh, the, as I mentioned before, the national, regional, uh, and uh, um, youth forums, uh, and those, I think, are a very peculiar and very relevant uh, mechanism of the IGF, which can uh, help to uh, raise awareness with the broader community, as Nana was saying, going also beyond those who participate directly and, and spread. 
uh, awareness uh, uh, and also um, capacity building uh, through those networks, which is important. I also uh, know that uh, uh, now we are in the process, of course, of building this uh, new element of the IGF, which is the leadership panel. And I think it's very important because it has a tremendous potential to build on and support the MAG, but also to raise the profile of the forum as a whole, to amplify the key messages, to help decision makers. So that is a new element which we, we think will be very important. And the parliamentarian track, the, the closeness with uh, uh, regulators uh, will certainly make uh, the um, IGF more visible, more uh, more interesting uh, and its ideas better known. So I think that uh, all this plus, of course, uh, necessary funding uh, to do even more uh, will all improve and raise the profile, I think, of this uh, incredible good and uh, uh, necessary network we, we are as IGF. And I look forward as a tech envoy office to receive those key messages, to be you know, a, a, an entry point for bringing these ideas into the common agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Very appropriate view for a tech envoy. <laughs> um, so thank you. The next person I have is Anita. Please. Uh, are these at me? I believe I said you. Yes, Anita, please. Are you sorry? I, I couldn't hear very clearly. Yeah, thank you. Oh, so while the I just, microphone was um, off, I apologize. That's that's perfectly fine. Um, the IGF is not like other human bodies that develop norms and soft law, and this is something we know very well. The WSIs give it the mandate to provide a public agora for digital policy discussions and not to forge consensus. As a recent letter to the Secretary General from JNC highlights, the IGF must provide the best conditions for open, diverse, and inclusive policy discussions. Unfortunately, today the IGF does not pass this inclusivity test. And thankfully, because we've all been around for so long, there's a lot of research material out there which painstakingly documents various things, including in quantitative ways. The IGF lacks representational diversity in terms of who contributes to the pool of public opinion and biological extension, what digi digital issues become public or get politicized. The folks who come here may wear different hats, tech community, private sector, civil society, and many also do wear different hats across different years, which in common parlance is referred to as the revolving door. But broadly, their interests in political ideologies represent a shared consensus. This consensus is not good for the political agora. It suggests an elitism that discounts particular intersectional locations. Social movements, the public for whom public digital goods are sought to be created, are missing. Many developing countries and even businesses other than big tech are not there. One study has found that it takes 95 countries to reach the amount of civil society representation from just one country, the United States. So what's vital going forward is to see how a rebooted networked multilateralism for digital public policy can benefit from the complementarities that IGF can offer to galvanize new publics for a rhetorical pluralism that prizes open the dominant consensus at the IGF. The power of the IGF is in the ideal type global community it can grow to represent as the public of publics in the post-national agora. This is crucial because states may not prioritize certain publics. The IGF can support the many overlapping communities of interest to challenge corporate and statist interests in pursuit of the highest ideals of human life. The monocultures of multi-stakeholderism need to be broken by injecting democratic representation into the ways of the IGF. For instance, health activists from the Global South have a lot to say about data rights, as do biodiversity activists who care about digital sequence information. How can they be involved? Openness means looking outward and downward making the effort to understand how the disenfranchised communities see their role in relation to public policy making. We need a post-multi-stakeholderist IGF that can deepen the democratic quotient of public policy debates on the digital. 
making way for less powerful voices and providing new frames that a new institutional framework for global digital cooperation can benefit from. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. And Milton, please. Thank you. Um, so how can the IGF adapt, innovate, and reform? So we need to understand what the IGF is and is not and what it can and cannot do. The IGF is not and never will be a policy-making body. It's an open forum where stakeholders of all types can meet in equal status and the equality of status, I think, is crucial to its identity and its function. It affects policy indirectly by bringing networks together where people come to trust each other, uh, learn from each other, and then possibly go off and do something together. But it's a micro-level phenomenon. So co cooperation requires trust and familiarity, and IGF can help build that. Most of the proposals to strengthen, strengthen the IGF are based on a false idea that the IGF can become something more than what I've described. And I don't think those ideas will succeed. At best, they will create some new organizations and crown a few heads with the status of leaders. And the digital world will move on not noticing at worst, it will contribute to the decline of the IGF status as an open, equal footing forum where new ideas can bubble up. So to adapt to the future, the IGF has to boldly embrace the real policy controversies that face the internet. This means that the MAG needs to be strengthened. We need less people on it and more focused people separate tracks that are run by the secretariat and not from the bottom up need to be eliminated. The people on the MAG should be people with real ideas about what issues are important, not people selected because they conform to some category. And those issues that they think are important should be truly global internet governance issues and not things that uh, take place at a local and national level and are handled by them or not things that are adjacent domains of policy like climate change. We need to stop shying away from raising problems and issues related to powerful nation states or corporations. I'm told that at last year's session on the US-China competition, which I helped organize, uh, there were pressures behind the scenes, but ultimately we did get to do that. And it was a very successful panel that raised, uh, developed a lot of benefit in terms of clearing the air about some of those tensions. But those are exactly the kind of discussions that can advance cooperation via the IGF. So we have to avoid any kind of veto power given to nation states in, in the UN process. Uh, this is not the Security Council. In conclusion, I would say, if discussions in the IGF are not making certain powerful global players a little bit uncomfortable, then that's a sign that it's not succeeding. It, it would mean that they care about what goes on here and they may have something to hide from the global community if they're afraid of having things discussed. So you can't have digital cooperation without full transparency and the IGF is a great place to bring those issues to light. Thank you. Thank you, Milton. Um, amazing number of points. I need to come back to you again, Sukyun, although we have very little time, to see if there are any comments that you wanted to bring forth from the chat. And while we have very little time, four minutes as far as I can tell, I did have a hand raised in the room uh, from our last time that might want to go back. But first to you, Sukyung, to see if you had anything to bring forward. Yeah, uh, we have seven minutes and not four. Oh, seven I mean, minutes. The clock in front of me so said... So we have seven minutes. Oh, good. But uh, um, actually, I would like to pose a question to Henriette. Henriette Esterhusen is a MAC chair, and she has been with the MAC and IGF for a very long time. Right. And She's looking for a microphone now. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. She's okay. looking around for a microphone. 
Ah, okay. So, I mean, I would like to, to raise a question or pose a question to Henriette, the market chair who is with us and who has been with the IGF for a very long time. And there have been a lot of things that Milton suggested also with regard to changes at the market. And I would like to hear from Henriette, what is your perspective on the IGF? That would interest me. That's, that's a really good question to ask. Henriette, I see you have a microphone now, so please. Thank you. Thank you, Suki, and um, thanks to everyone. I agree with a lot of what Moulton said, but not all of it. I think that the IGF strength is as a public participation platform. It's not a policy-making body, but it can make other policy being made elsewhere better. Um, but to do that, Milton, we do need the environmental activists here. We do need the labor movement here. We need people that work on social and economic injustice here. We, 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 and that's the strength of this, uh, of this <coughs> forum. So, um, Suki, I, I think the MAG is vital, and I agree with Milton. We need a strong MAG. I feel that the IGF is diversifying. I think that's important. It does have to be an all-round year process. It needs to have high-level components. It needs to bring governments and intergovernmental uh, uh, organizations into the space and legislators. But I feel that the strength of the IGF, um, which is its bottom-up character, the fact that we have this channel from people on the ground through the MAG building a program that is relevant to them, that we're losing that by fragmenting the IGF ecosystem into so many different components. I think we need those components, um, but we need to not uh, stop having them being brought together and connected to the bottom-up process through the MAG. So I'm not opposed at all to the idea of a leadership panel. I think we need that, but I'd like to see it be integrally part of the MAG and work hand-in-hand -hand with the MAG. Thank you. Um, it was really good to hear you speak on it. Um, okay, did you, so Kyung, did you have anything else before I go to the hands that I've seen in the, in the no, participants on the floor? Okay, so please, there's a person at the back there. My vision is not that good. It's a man at the back there, with a mask. And then I saw one over there, but. And the lady here. Right, and the lady there. Okay, so that's three that we'll get. So one, two, because I saw that one, two, and then three. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Iba Wojciech. I'm from Syria. I've been working uh, for in this field of ICT and IGF and, uh, and policy making for the last, since, since the WISIS and Tunis agenda. Uh, I don't want to talk about polemics, but, but if you remember the enhanced cooperation term which was drafted in Tunis agenda, till today, probably we don't know exactly what was intended by that term, and we still live in that ambiguity. Uh, what I'm deeply concerned, and, but I'm not skeptical, is that we are facing a new, uh, at the time that the internet was just a, technica, uh, a, a technical world, which was almost detached from, re, uh, from the life of everyone, uh, at that time there was, there was so much polemic about the internet governance, and, uh, and how it's going to be governed, ruled, and managed, that that time, the very ambiguous language had been used, and that process was expedited to an IGF where, which did not have a policy-making uh, power, but, or, or, but, but was very useful to bringing ideas forward. What's concerning is that now that the internet is entrenched in almost every single aspect of our lives, we might be facing uh, something very difficult and complicated to discuss. Uh, the IGF would be very likely become too broad for so many people of us to be able to follow, especially in small countries where, don't, we, where we don't have enough resources to, uh, to follow. Uh, we wish, and I, well, I wish, and, that, that's, and you can in, in, uh, consider what is the, the me, but what do I represent? But, I wish that this could be taken in consideration. Small countries could be very simply lost in this process. Their voices uh, cannot be easily channeled. Uh, the Under Secretary General uh, in, in the first, uh, in, the, um, in the zero day panel, when he talked about the wonderful uh, cooperation of the world 
related to the pandemic, he mentioned that there were so many cooperation to provide vaccine for the others. I hope that this new um, introduced form of digital cooperation would, would, bring, would be able to bring a concrete result like that effort which was done and help at the end of the day, no, it's not the market which bring people in connected to the internet. Business as usual will result in the same uneven and uh, e uh, uneven distribution of access and uneven capability to influence it. We can keep saying it's a bottom-up process, but at the end of the day, we remain out of it. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Okay, can the microphone go? There's the hand. Hello to everybody. My name is Mr. Jallo Alassane. I'm from Guinea, Conakry. So I want to it's the first time I'm coming to IGF. Welcome. But since I came here, I did some remarks. So I assist to some sessions and meetings. But I remark uh, most of the sessions, they are speaking in English. So there was a suggestion I would like to do, because uh, there are some friends here, some people. Not uh, everybody speaks uh, English. So. I assist to some conference in another countries, but uh, they are using an earphone translator. I think it will be good uh, to think about it uh, for the next session, because if people come, come here, is to get benefit of the meetings, so yeah. to give their idea also, but uh, most I see also here the, the room is uh, almost uh, empty, not so full. So maybe it depends on the language okay. also. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, in this room, in these main sections, we do have translators at the back. There were microphones and such as that, that people could have gotten. It isn't the case in all sessions, but in these main sessions, indeed, there are okay. multiple languages. OK, thank you very much. You're welcome. Please, the microphone comes here. Pendant que le micro fait son voyage, Diallo, Diallo, au niveau national, il y a aussi l'IGF. Et c'est là qu'on peut parler jusqu'à Soso. Donc, ça, c'est l'international, oui. Mais chez nous, on peut parler, euh, à, on peut bien tenir une IGF dans nos langues nationales. Et on peut même euh, le faire quand on veut. Donc, on accepte l'international, mais arrivé à la maison, on le fait à notre manière, à notre langue. Merci. OK, please. Uh, hello, my name is Kristina, and I work for Ukrainian section of Polish radio. And I have a question about digital divide, because I guess that we have pretty many countries uh, which are digital divided. And you said a little about China. So I have a question if we can expect that one day China would allow its citizens to use legally Facebook, TikTok, not just Great Firewall, if we can expect this. And if there is uh, any way uh, to cooperate with China in this, uh, about this theme. Thank you so much. Thank you for the question. I don't know if anybody on the panel has an expectation. Uh, I, I, I think guess we may was... have hope, but I don't know about expectations. I'm sorry, I gotta say it was uh, a question for Mr. Mueller. For Mr. Mueller. <laughs> Mr. Mueller. So do, do we um, expect, expect uh, China to open up its uh, information economy? Um, no, uh, the trend is in the opposite direction at the moment. It's uh, a very uh, disturbing trend in many respects. Um, uh, China goes through cycles of openness and closedness, and they're very much in a a barrier building uh, cycle right now, uh, a kind of a paranoid cycle, um, which I have to be fair, the US is also kind of uh, in that space, uh, at least uh, certainly was during the Trump administration. Uh, so that's why I think that, you know, when we talk about digital cooperation, we really need to talk about these relationships between the great powers in uh, the geopolitical space 
Uh, and right now we have these three major blocks, Europe, the US, and China. And uh, I'm sorry about you know sounding maybe, I'm, I'm just reflecting reality. I'm not saying that the rest of the world is not important, but what I'm saying is that these three blocks are really making decisions about policy that uh, really sort of set the terms for the rest of the world. So I would be very much in favor of uh, the US, China, and Europe and negotiating freer uh, arrangements regarding uh, the flow of information between and, and the services uh, between these countries and uh, also working out acceptable privacy and data protection uh, practices among them, I think, and, and I think that, uh, you know, that's the kind of issue that the, the IGF needs to facilitate. Uh, uh, somebody earlier said it really takes time to develop things, and uh, again, expecting the IGF to suddenly, you know, become an influential player in this is not realistic, but we can set the groundwork, we can form the networks. I've, I've uh, met and worked with many people Thank from China. You. So, I've been getting the signal yeah. that our time is up. And so forgive me for interrupting, but it sounded like it could have been a really good lecture if I had been able to let it go. So I want to thank all the panelists. I want to thank all the participants. And I want to say that I'm heartened to see the uh, Secretary General again paying attention to the IGF and to the digital world, and I'm curious to see where it goes. Thank you, the session is ended.